bless you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Thank you, worship team. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 47. I want to talk a little bit about the river of God this morning. Ezekiel chapter 47. Good to be home. We were away last weekend in Trinidad uh, ministering with our friend Bishop Chanker Singh and our friend Pastor Raymond Mui. Uh, saw a lot of great healing miracles, and it was a, a great weekend, and uh, we got to miss the snowstorm, so thank you, Jesus, for that. We were praying for you. <laughs> Ezekiel 47, uh, very quickly, next week, I want to let you know that we're starting a new series called Jesus, Our Magnificent Obsession. Uh, it's based on a book that we picked up recently that has just touched our hearts and uh, we've actually ordered copies of that book, and we're going to have them available for you next week. And uh, for the next several weeks leading up to Easter, uh, we're coming into the Lenten season. We're going to be sharing this book week by week together, and we hope you'll be reading along with us. And uh, it will be a great time for you to invite a friend to come to church with you, coworker, a family member, a neighbor, uh, as we begin this new series looking at our wonderful Savior, Jesus and falling in love with him all over again. Jesus, our magnificent obsession. And so we hope you'll uh, join us for that and be with us. Ezekiel chapter 47. Let's talk about the river of God. Ezekiel is getting an angel-guided tour of the temple. And this is the conclusion of his temple tour. Ezekiel 47, beginning in verse 1. It says, the man brought me back. It wasn't a man, it was an angel. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple sanctuary toward the east, for the temple faces east. The water was coming down under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, and then he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man... Do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah. The Arabah is the Jordan River Valley where it enters the Dead Sea. And when it empties into the Dead Sea, the salty water there becomes healed. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglaim. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh they will be left for salt. Why? Because salt is useful and valuable. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. Father, I ask that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, we just say amen and amen. Since the beginning of this new year, we've been talking about the river of God. The last time that we were together, we started looking at Ezekiel 47. And there are some prophetic promises in this chapter for us in this new year. We shared the first one with you two weeks ago. It goes like this. In 2016, we are going to be overwhelmed by the rising river of God's presence. 
The Bible says that in the midst of this troubled world, God has a city. Nature might roar and shake in 2016. The nations might roar and shake, but God has a city that is safe and secure. If you're wondering where is this city, you're standing in it. The city is not a where, it's a who. The city is you. Jesus told us so himself. And in the midst of God's city, in the midst of God's people, there is a river. The river is not a what, but it's a who too. The river is the Holy Spirit inside of you. Jesus told us about that river. He said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, where? In Ezekiel 47, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water shall flow within him. By this he meant the Holy Spirit. The last time we were together, we looked a little bit at the source of God's river. We saw that God's river originates from God's throne. It originates from his dwelling place. It originates from his own presence. Ezekiel saw water running out from under the threshold of the temple sanctuary where the Holy of Holies was, where God sat on the Ark of the Covenant between the wings of the cherubim. The river is God's own extension of himself in our direction. You see, we can't go to the Holy of Holies just now. We can't travel to the highest of heaven. We are still earthbound in these human bodies. And so in his mercy and his grace, his own presence outward toward us via the river of the Holy Spirit. God extends his own divine essence, the current of his own divine life. Everything that God is, he puts in that river and he pushes it out to where we are. How awesome is that? This river of God in Ezekiel 47, it's a picture that God has reached out from heaven and he has extended himself to us. You know, Paul said God is hoping that men will reach out and find him because he is not far from any one of us. Beloved, listen to me this morning. The great God that made the universe, the great God that said, let there be light, the great God that formed man out of the dust of the earth, he is not very far from you this morning. He's just hoping that you'll reach out and that you'll find him. We also saw that God's river comes to us by way of the person of Jesus exclusively. Ezekiel saw that river that came out of the threshold of the temple building. He saw it run past the altar of sacrifice in the temple of courtyard. That speaks of the cross of Jesus Christ. The New Testament says that Jesus is that altar. And he was the sacrifice on that altar, the Lamb of God. We also saw that God's river extends to us the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. That river, it passed to the south of the great altar where was located the bronze wash basin that the priests used to wash their feet and their hands and their faces for duty. And that speaks of the purifying work of the Holy Spirit, the New Testament tells us. Along with the source of God's river, we also saw the supernatural rise of God's river. In verse 2 of Ezekiel 47, we learn that when the river leaves the temple, it is nothing more than a trickle. In fact, the Hebrew word there is the word gurgle. It means the sound that water makes when it leaves the mouth of a canteen. Go, 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 go. But the angel guide leads Ezekiel wading through that little gurgle of water. And against all the laws of nature, it grows into a mighty rushing river. He goes wading through the water. And after a little distance, it's ankle deep. And he goes a little further and it's knee deep. And he goes a little further and it's waist deep. And he goes a little further and now it's over his head. And the angel stops and he said, son of man, look at this. 
Look at how this river has risen supernaturally. Look at how this river has risen from a trickle to a mighty torrent against all the laws of nature. Look at how this river has risen and it is God's own doing. You know, that supernatural rise of God's river, it's a picture of our whole salvation experience and especially of our experience in the Holy Spirit. You see, our salvation, it begins with just one small moment of divine encounter. But then it's an experience that keeps growing and growing and growing until it overtakes our whole life. David had that kind of rising river experience in his life. He wrote, as the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. And then a few lines later, he wrote deep calls unto deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and your breath over me. What started with just a little thirst for God resulted in an experience that overwhelmed his entire life. You know, Jesus told us that we can anticipate that kind of rising river experience too. In John chapter 4, he said that salvation begins just like a little spring inside of us. But in John chapter 7, he said our experience in the Holy Spirit grows until it is a mighty gushing river inside of us. And here's our first prophetic promise for 2016. Look at this supernaturally rising river and expect to experience the same this year. Expect to be overwhelmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit as he rises among us. We were here on Friday evening for Fire in the Night. want to thank Pastor Ruth and want to thank all of our pastors and all of our worship leaders, worship team, everyone who came to pray from six o'clock Friday evening to six o'clock Saturday morning. And about 11 p.m. I was sitting in my seat just enjoying the presence of the Lord that was so beautiful in the sanctuary. And one of our sisters from Stanford came up to me and she said, Pastor, I feel like I have a word from the Lord for you. And she hasn't been here. She hasn't heard what we've been talking about here in Greenwich about the river of God since she's been over in Stanford. She said, I don't know whether this makes any sense to you, but she said, I feel like the Holy Spirit told me to tell you that the levels are rising in the house. Some prophetic promises for 2016. The second promise is this. In 2016, we are going to experience radical, supernatural transformations. Ezekiel saw the source of God's river. He saw the supernatural rise of God's river. And then he saw the effects of God's river. What can we expect God to do in 2016? This vision, it shows us, first of all, I believe that God is saying that he is going to reverse the curse over your life. The Bible says that because of sin, all of creation and all of mankind are under a curse. Our relationships are cursed. Our work is cursed. Our financial security is cursed. It's all in Genesis chapter 3. You could read it there. Our health is cursed. Our environment is cursed. Paul said that all of creation is subjected to frustration and groans under this curse. We're estranged from God. And we're helplessly exposed to our adversary, the devil. In addition, we're all subject to curses that are specific to us because of our family history and because of some of our own personal choices. Do you know that the sins committed by our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents, they come with spiritual baggage that gets passed down to us. This is called generational iniquity or generational curses. God said in Exodus chapter 34 that the sins of the fathers are visited on their children and their grandchildren, even to the third and to the fourth generation. In Lamentations chapter 5 verse 7, it says our fathers have sinned and now they're gone, but we're here 
bearing the consequences. Peter put it this way, our fathers have handed down to us an empty way of life. David wrote, surely I was sinful at birth from the time my mother conceived me. You know, psychology and criminology, sociology, genetic science, they are all just beginning to catch up with what the Bible has taught for thousands of years. That sinful tendencies and sinful behaviors and their consequences travel down family lines from one generation to the next. Do you know alcoholism travels in family lines? Substance abuse, addiction, compulsive behaviors, criminal behavior, violent behavior. Scientists are finding genetic evidence of it traveling in family lines. Abuse travels down family lines. Sexual addiction, sexual deviance travels down family lines. There's a whole plethora of mental and emotional and sociological and physical disorders that travel down family lines. Scientists are finding in the genetic code, in strands of DNA, they are finding genes that predispose people to certain behaviors and certain disorders and certain diseases. But beloved, I would submit to you this morning that it's not a biological problem. It's not a sociological problem or a psychological problem, but it's a spiritual problem. It's sin's curse, specifically generational curses. In the era following Noah's flood, the Bible's ultimate example of sin's curse is the judgment of Sodom that resulted in the creation of the Dead Sea and the Judean wilderness. For you Wednesday night Genesis scholars who are studying with Pastor Nick, you might remember that when Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, the Bible says that it was a well-watered plain. In fact, Genesis says that Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding region were lush like the Garden of God. They looked like the Garden of Eden. But because of their sin, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding region with fire. Peter and Jude say it's the Bible's ultimate example of punishment. And when God destroyed Sodom, it became the most cursed place on all of planet Earth. How many of you have ever gotten a nice big swallow of ocean water? Make you want to spit up, burns your nose, burns your throat. Do you know that the ocean is about 3.5% salty? The Dead Sea is 35% salty. More salty than the worst mouthful of Atlantic Ocean water you have ever had. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea. There is no aquatic life there is no plant life. There is no animal life sustained on its shores. The Dead Sea is deathly toxic. Do you know that one splash of Dead Sea water in your eye can permanently blind you? A swallow of Dead Sea water can make you violently ill, and if you aspirate it in your lungs, it can kill you. It's the lowest place on planet Earth. It has a putrid smell. It's called the stinking sea. The soil and the springs around the Dead Sea are full of sulfur. Asphalt bubbles up from the floor of the Dead Sea. Now imagine, this is the place that was once as lush as the Garden of Eden, now cursed in every way that it could possibly be. You see, that's what sin does to us every time. Fun for a short season but its end result is always death. Solomon wrote, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Marriages that should have been flourishing and beautiful for a lifetime, sin curses and kills them. Bonds between parents and children that should have been strong and beautiful for a lifetime Sin curses and kills them. Friendships, partnerships, 
careers that should have been brilliant and productive and profitable. Sin curses and kills them. Bodies that should have been healthy and sound for a long life. Sin curses and kills them. You can choose to ignore the Bible's enumeration of sins. You can choose not to believe the Bible's warnings, but you cannot escape the destructive consequences of sin, not in this life and certainly not in the next. And the Dead Sea is there to this day to remind us of that. But how many of you know the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news? The gospel is the good news that there exists a remedy for sin, a means to reverse the curse of sin. There exists a means of deliverance from generational curses. There exists a means of repairing the damage that has been done by sin. On the cross, Jesus himself, the curse of sin. You know, in a way that really exceeds my ability to fully explain to you, Paul said that Jesus became accursed himself in our place. He took upon himself the full penalty of our sins, the cup of God's wrath that should have been poured out on us was poured out on him instead. And in doing that, he sets us free from the curse that we were born under and from the curses that we have been living under when we put our faith in him. Amen. Ezekiel 47 contains one of the most hopeful pictures in the entire Bible. There is a river of God's presence. It originates in his sanctuary. It comes by way of the cross and it carries with it the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. This river emerges from God's temple as just a little trickle, but it grows into a gushing torrent and this river runs down into the Jordan Valley and then it pours into the Dead Sea and when it hits the Dead Sea, it reverses the curse and the Dead Sea comes to life again. It is the no longer Dead Sea. Beloved, I want you to understand the significance of this. One of the most fertile places on earth became the most cursed place on earth. But the river of God has the power to reverse the curse and to make it flourish again. Do you understand what that means? It means that they're, listen, somebody receive this. It's for you today. Hear the word of the Lord. There is no amount of damage that sin has done to you that cannot be undone by the cross of Christ and the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. If God can undo the lake of Sodom, then God can undo anything. There's no depth of sin that you've sunken to. That's beyond God's reach to administer his cleansing and his healing and his restoration. There's no generational curse hanging over you that is beyond God's ability to repeal. Peter wrote, you know, it's true. We have been handed an empty way of life by our fathers, but... Jesus has set us free, he wrote, by his precious blood. In Ezekiel 18, it, God says, You shall no longer use this proverb. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and their children's teeth are set on edge. The son shall no longer bear the guilt of the father. But if a man turns from his sins, he shall surely live and not die. None of the transgressions he has committed will be remembered against him anymore. And here's the prophetic promise for 2016. As this river of the Holy Spirit supernaturally rises in the midst of this city of God, God is going to reverse the curses that we were born under and the curses that we have been living under. 
What is God going to do in 2016? The Holy Spirit is going to heal the toxic environments around you. Everything about the Dead Sea and the surrounding wilderness is toxic. The water is toxic. The soil is toxic. The subterranean springs are toxic. The atmosphere is toxic. But God's river changes that toxic environment into a wholesome environment. It changes a lethal environment into a life-giving, life-sustaining environment. It changes an inhospitable environment into an inviting environment, a noxious environment into a nurturing environment. Can I tell you, some of us have been hanging on for far too long in toxic environments. Toxic marriages, toxic parent-child relationships, toxic atmospheres in your home. Rather than being the place of refuge that God intended your home to be, it's a place you avoid. You stay at work longer than you really have to. You run errands that aren't really necessary. You sit in your car Mustering the courage to go in when you put your hand on the doorknob, you take a deep breath because you don't know what's going to be on the other side of that door. Toxic. Toxic relationships, toxic friendships, toxic work environments. Some of you even have a toxic commute and you're all by yourself. (laughs) There are even toxic churches. Some of you have been there. But beloved, listen to me. I believe that this is the year that God wants to transform the toxic environments in our life. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. (laughs) Jerusalem will be for you a quiet home. And there the majestic Lord will be for us a broad river that no enemy can approach us. God wants to send the river of the Holy Spirit into every toxic environment in your life and he wants to transform it. What can we expect God to do in 2016? The Holy Spirit is going to make you perpetually fruitful. Ezekiel looks around him and where there was once a barren wilderness, there are now endless groves of fruit trees. The Bible says that one tree was bearing many, many different kinds of fruit. The waters that were once dead are now teeming with life. of What that means, it means that the Holy Spirit is going to enable you this year to produce variety and volume and quality. There was a large variety, there was a large volume of very good fruit. There was a large variety, a large volume of delicious fish, as many as are found in the Mediterranean Sea. And that picture contains a promise for us. The Holy Spirit is going to make you prolifically productive in 2016. He's going to enable you to be successful in a wide variety of endeavors. He's going to enable you to do everything you do with superior quality. (laughs) Pastor Nick and I were talking about one of our favorite authors last week. He's the general editor of a series of commentaries that we love, and he's the author of many of the volumes, both Old and New Testament books, which is very unusual. He's a seminary professor. He planted and he pastored a megachurch for decades. He holds multiple degrees, and in the course of it, he managed to raise a family who all loved Jesus and who followed him in the ministry. And when Pastor Nick and I look at his body of work, we're just astounded by the sheer quantity and by the superlative quality of it. It takes us hours to sit and just read it and digest it, but he researched it all and wrote it all. But we realize that he didn't do it on his own. It was the Holy Spirit that enabled him to produce that much variety and that much volume and that much quality. And the Holy Spirit is going to do the same for you and for me. 
Beloved, listen to me. You can be a good husband and a good father. You can be a good wife and a good mother. You can be successful in your career. You can be a successful student. You can develop your God-given talents and abilities. You can serve the body of Christ and be a leader in his church. You can be involved in the work of evangelism and missions. You can be a good friend. You can be a good neighbor. You can can live a successful life of variety and volume and quality because it doesn't depend on you, but because the Holy Spirit will enable you to do it. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the Lord. He shall be like a tree by rivers of living water. His leaf will never fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper. Come on, you need to grab a hold of that. Holy Spirit's going to make you useful in every season of your life until he calls you home. Because the fruit trees are watered by God's river, Ezekiel saw that they bore fruit 12 months out of the year, just kept bearing fruit. Their leaves never withered and their fruit never stopped yielding. They didn't have a downtime. They didn't have a dormant time. They just kept producing fruit, producing fruit. You know, in just a couple of months, I'm going to turn the big 5-0. And I have to tell you the truth. I've been thinking a lot about withering lately. My kids like to remind me that physically I've withered a little bit. But I have to tell you the truth. I think more about my ministry withering. The millennials coming behind us are perhaps the most complex and difficult generation to minister to ever in the history of our country. And I think about it and I say, Lord, what on earth? How can we reach them? I, I feel very ill prepared in myself to reach them. Quite a while ago, I was speaking to an old friend of mine on the phone and I was telling him about some of the exciting things that were happening at harvest time. And he said to me, Glenn, he said, you're in a highly creative time in your ministry. He said, enjoy it while you can because it won't last. You know, I don't call that friend anymore. <laughs> I, I, I misplaced his number. I, I lost his number. I didn't receive what he said to me then, and I don't receive it now. Because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that there is a river inside of me and there is a river inside of you. It's the precious Holy Spirit. And though my body may wither a little bit, my spirit never will. And your spirit never will because we are watered by God's river. Paul might waste away just a little bit, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And though we might keep passing milestones 4050607080 oh i don't care we are not going to stop producing fruit all year every year until jesus calls us home somebody listen to me your time of ministry is not done your day is not over. God is not nearly through doing what he's going to do on the earth through the ministry that he has entrusted to you. You said, well, it's time to hang up my shoes and pass it on to another generation. Here's what the word of the Lord says. One generation shall declare his works to the next. So who's going to reach the millennials? You are. I am. We are together because we're one generation and we have a story to tell of the faith of God and great things he has done and we're going to tell another generation <laughs> says that the leaves of the trees serve for healing and the fruit serves for food I don't care what you call them baby bus generation XYZ PDQ <laughs> I don't care what you call them they need healing and they need spiritual food. And we have something to serve them. 
what God going to do in 2016, worship team, come help me. The Holy Spirit is going to cause what is dead to come alive again. What could possibly be deader than the Dead Sea? What could possibly be destroyed beyond repair more than the Lake of Sodom? There is no force of nature. There is no man-made effort that could ever heal the Dead Sea, but God can. Is there a Dead Sea in your life today? Is your marriage deader than it can be? Is your relationship with your parents or with a sibling or with your own children destroyed beyond repair? Are your finances broken beyond all hope? Is your loved one sick? Is your body sick beyond remedy? Beloved, listen to me this morning and receive the word of the Lord. The river flows. Everything will live. Wherever the river flows, everything will live. Is your husband spiritually deader than anyone you know? Wherever the river flows, everything will live. Are your children spiritually dead even though you raised them in church and your heart is broken? Wherever the river flows, everything will live. Are you watching your grandchildren and they're growing up dead? They're growing up in the world that even though you raised your kids in the church, they're not raising their kids in the church and you see them in the world without Christ and your heart is broken listen to me everywhere the river flows everything will live mm. Ezekiel saw many fish in the no longer dead sea all along the shores fishermen were casting their nets and pulling in huge volume and variety of fish you know in the Bible fish represent souls in fact, many people believe that Ezekiel 47 was in the back of John's mind when he wrote John 21 about the 153 fish that were caught in the net. And John says they were all big fish. Beloved, I want to tell you that I believe that this is the year that many souls are going to get saved, especially the big fish. God's going to help us reel in the people that have been the most reluctant, the most resistant to the gospel, the most self-absorbed people, the most argumentative, the most contentious pity to reel them in. Those big fish, they're coming in. Many fish. The Bible says he brings many sons to glory. Listen, not just a few people are going to know Jesus. Many people are going to know Jesus. And wherever the river of God flows, if it's flowing in you, it's flowing in your house and wherever it flows everything shall live what can we expect God to do in 2016 finally this the Holy Spirit is going to transform your whole life not just part of it Ezekiel saw fishermen all around the circumference of the Dead Sea from En Gedi on the western shore to En Eglaim on the eastern shore, around the entire circumference, he saw men fishing. You know, that Dead Sea, it's 50 miles long. It's 11 miles wide. It is 1,200 feet deep. And Ezekiel saw that all of it was no longer dead. All of it was healed. All of it was restored. All of it was teeming with life. All of it was productive. All of it was blessed. It wasn't just better in some parts, but not in others. It was radically and entirely transformed. Beloved, let me tell you, you are going to be radically and entirely transformed. Biblical Christianity isn't about your efforts to become a little bit better than you were. No, it's about a radical transformation of your entire life that is the work of God supernaturally by the blood of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit. God's going to radically change all of your life. Your inner nature changed. Your desires changed. 
your thoughts changed. Your speech changed. Your emotions changed. Your behavior changed. Your relationships changed. Your goals in life, your direction in life changed. And all it takes is just a little trickle from God's sanctuary. All it takes is just a few drops of blood from his hands, from his feet, from his brow. All it takes is just a little gush of blood and water from the side of the Savior. All it takes is just a little splash of the Holy Spirit, just a little trickle of pure water from God's sanctuary. It's enough to change your whole life. At the very end of humanity's story, John sees this river one more time. And here's how the story ends. The very end of the book of Revelation, John says, the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God. And no longer was there any curse. Do you know how your story ends in Christ? It ends with the entire radical transformation of your whole life and no longer is there any curse. Some prophetic promises for 2016. We're going to be overwhelmed by the rising presence of the Holy Spirit and we're going to experience radical supernatural transformations. Harvest Time Church Receive the word of the Lord. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus a great big praise in this place? Come on, give him a great big praise. Don't give him a wimpy little praise. Give him a great.